The sun Your stories don't define you, but how you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief storymaker at Elkins Consulting. Whether you're sharing personal stories or business stories, the stories you share matter. They tell people who are listening a lot about who you are. The stories you share about yourself, definitely. But even more, the stories you tell about others. Remember, listeners, if you are interviewing or getting ready to interview, my course, Job Interview Storytelling, is now available on Udemy. It's a very reasonable price because the goal is to guide people to feel more confident as they step into an interview and get the job that they deserve. Today, you are in for a treat. My friend Emily Carlson is on the line, and we are going to share some really pivotal career stories that are going to inspire and motivate you to consider your career stories. And just right up front, I would love to thank Diane Wiska, who is also a storytelling coach and one of my good friends who made this introduction. So Emily, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Sarah. Well, I'm excited to get started. Um, We met months ago and you interviewed me for your podcast and now I am bringing you onto mine. And I'm so glad for this because the moment we met, I knew we had a connection, particularly around how our stories can change the way we experience ourselves when we consider them from different perspectives. And with your work, shifting uh, into, well, your tech work and where you have lived in that as a woman in tech. Um, I'm, I'm eager to get into these stories and how you, how you guide other women in particular that are in fields that are unusual for women. So thank you again. I'm, I'm really eager to get, to jump into this. I'm so excited to be here and to have this conversation with you. And uh, it's just such a, a thrill to be here. And uh, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, well, you know, because you've listened to a few of my episodes that I love to begin by asking you to share something about yourself that most people might not know about you. And I do that so that we get a more complex view of who you are. We have a tendency because of social media and because of our short attention span to pinpoint somebody in time about who they are, what they care about, without recognizing how complicated people can be. So I would love it if you could share something about yourself that most people don't know. Yeah. I mean, one thing right off the bat that I, I'm not sure people realize is how I started my career. Um, I was a uh a woman right out of high school, I guess not even a woman at that point, you know, you're leaving high school and you don't have the world behind you like you do when you get into your your 50s. Um, I left high school. I did not take the traditional route of college. I ended up um, uh, having a baby. (laughs) And when I had my baby, I did not want to leave him uh, with anybody else. Uh, But I also wanted to go out and have a job and be able to help provide for my family. Uh, So I I found a small career uh, with a small computer shop. My town is pretty small. Uh, So one computer store uh, I was able to get a job at. I could bring Ken with me. So producer Ken, uh, as the world knows him by now, (laughs) um, (laughs) I brought his pack and play. And he sat beside me while I sat at a bench assembling computers and installing software. And that's really how I got my forte into uh, IT, um, that I I knew I needed to do something in this world. Um, and I knew I did not want to leave my baby. So I brought him with me. Um, and that's just kind of how my career started. I was very fortunate to be able to find a place, especially back in the 90s, that would allow um, you know, you to bring your child to work with you, uh, to be able to get to learn hands on. You know, I think my perspective is is still to this day, 
I can teach the tech, but I can't teach the work ethic. And I think that's uh, kind of what the opportunity uh, was seen in, in me as well. Wow. I love that. Now I understand after a recording of, of the episode that you and I recorded for your podcast, Powered by Authenticity, um, I can see why my story of leaving Washington, D.C. so that I could spend more time with my kid, why that resonated with you. Yep. And um, I, I I don't know. I have, I have to ask. I did not intend to have children at all. Um, <laughs> and I waited a long time, for, well, by my standards back in the 90s. I was almost 30 when our first was born. And uh, believe it or not, in Washington, D.C., I was one of the younger women having a baby. Mm -hmm. None of my friends had had a baby yet. Um, but I was very career oriented and really didn't intend to have a kid until I met my husband and changed my mind, which is a whole other story. But um, you had kind of the opposite situation. Did you plan to have children eventually? Was this something that just happened earlier than you anticipated? I, you know, it's funny. No, I actually thought that uh, my life in front of me probably had moved to a city somewhere. You know, I the mm -hmm. thought of going to New York City was exciting. I love Toronto. So, you know, I, I don't think growing up, I necessarily thought that I would stay um, where I where I had, was raised and, and born and uh, still am to this day. Uh, it was it was my life took a different direction than what I think I had in my head when I was you know 15, 16 year old. Um, you know it's it's also kind of interesting because at the school that I'm at because in high school, um, very small, very rural, uh, I was asked what I wanted to be one day and I said CEO. And my <laughs> guidance counselor looked at me and said, no, girls from Alexander, New York do not become CEOs. And so I always, <laughs> yeah, so I had that too. And it just, um, you know, so I think there was always something in me that said, your life is going to take this direction. And it didn't. Um, and so I I pivoted my, my life and, uh, you know, being a young mom, uh, certainly is interesting. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I I had my my daughter uh, much later, so my kids are twelve years apart, and I have to say, being you know thirty and having a child is much different uh, than when you're you're younger. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and society, um, the way that you're treated is yeah. really different depending on the the time of your life that you end up having children. So that's that's another part, that's another layer to yeah. being a woman in tech is being a young mother in tech. Like that, yeah. that's a really unusual track to take. So now I'm curious when you, um, so you were working for this computer company, you were building mm -hmm. computers and installing software. What was the the change that, I mean, how, where did you go from there? <laughs> Great. Uh, the, so when Ken was four, uh, I decided it was probably time for him to go to nursery school and be with other kids and not just mom. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and he, he had cousins, so it wasn't like he was completely, you know, on his, his own with me. Uh, but I enrolled him in nursery school and I drove a few miles down the road and enrolled myself in college. So we enrolled in school the same day. Uh, and went out afterwards and, you know, I don't know if anybody remembers Chi Chi's, but we went out for a Chi Chi's lunch and had chips and salsa and, uh, celebrated the fact that we were both about to partake in something different, uh, than what we, we had started our lives together with. Um, and, you know, it's just, it, so I like to say we grew up together. <laughs> well, you have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of times that's what it feels like. And yeah, I, 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 I married uh, my husband at the time he, he was working and well, still my husband. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say it that way. We've been married for a very long time now. <laughs> um, but, you know, I was very fortunate that I had his support and, you know, we were, we were able to, you know, just find 
financially it was rough. Um, there were there were moments where there was no heat and a lot of different things that you know happen when you start a life together that mm-hmm. that young. But um, you know, I'm very fortunate that I also had that support mechanism behind me. So I, that I always said that I would go to school, um, and I actually enrolled to be a developer. So I thought I wanted to code based on how much I love software. That didn't mm-hmm. last very long because I'm <laughs> too social. Um, so. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, my my social skills lent very well to uh, help desk and to training and then to project management and, you know, just kind of building myself up to, to the sea level um, throughout the course of my career. But I always knew I'd, I'd go to college at some point. Uh, it was just, it just, you know, took took a, a few years to to get there uh and it was it's it's funny i still remember that day so vividly in my head despite the fact it was so many years ago now <laughs> well that's what was that was what was in my head as you were telling the story was it's so rich i was there with you sitting at that booth eating chips and salsa with you yeah i just mm-hmm. i could imagine that moment um and what i love about it there's so many things to love about it one of the things that I love about it is this idea that you were celebrating transition because so many times we fear transition. Um, we we know it has to happen. So sometimes we, we go forward anyway. Sometimes we fear transition enough for it to paralyze us. But what you did in that moment with Ken was celebrate the transition and change and acknowledge that it was an, a new adventure and that things we're going to be different. And I I love that for so many reasons. So that's that's one one thing that I that the story brought up for me. And another part is this idea that when when you're transitioning and you bring your family along for that ride, it's so much more likely to A, be successful because you have the support, but B, bring in more um understanding and championing of that transition. I I hear so many stories of people who go back to school as an adult or after having children, and they don't tell their partner that this is a dream that they had that they're going to fulfill and here are the ways that it's going to change our lives. Instead, they just say, I'm going back to school, and they don't necessarily take the partner along for the ride of why and what the goal is and how they can also transform and support wherever, you know, because life is going to change. So thank you for sharing that story. Oh, yeah. I, um, you know, it is funny throughout the years, I think the the transitional moments um, in our lives have, have actually brought us closer together. Uh, when I got pregnant with my my daughter, so my second child, Ken was so, so much older that he even he even came along for the ultrasounds where we found out what the gender was going to be and just different phases because I feel like to your point if you've got family that are involved in it and they're part of the journey um you you just you lend everybody up for success and everybody feels the accomplishments and the you know just a a huge center of 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 moments and you know I go. I go back to. Um, I can't remember what movie it is, but it's like the you know these tiny moments have meant more to me than you know all of the large moments in life. And it's true. Uh, if you've got people who are there with you every moment of the day and part of your journey, then we get to celebrate each other, and that's just mm-hmm. something special. I love that you said that because I often say it's actually on my bookmark for my book that um, your stories don't have to be epic; they have to be meaningful. Yeah. And that's exactly what you're saying. And that's what connects us is those those pivotal moments in our lives that are taking your kid out to Chi Chi's to celebrate <laughs> this transition and and yeah. transformation that will be occurring. And you know it. You can't you can't discount that and being not just aware of it, but celebrating it. Ah. Yeah. Okay. So you go back to school, you go into development for a while. Um, what was the the next job, the next career move that you realized 
this is another transformation. This is going to, this, this is taking me from where I was to where I will be. Yeah. Do you remember from, that? Oh, I do. I, I really do. Um, I was at the time um, doing uh, some training for a specific software application that supported um, Xerox offices globally. Um, and I, I just, I loved training. I fell in, lo in love with that. And out of the blue, I was offered an opportunity to go to work uh, with Pfizer um, and be able to teach their, this is going to date me a little bit, but <laughs> teach their uh, their sales reps how to connect using those little token cards we all use to get the RSA tokens. And and I took it. Uh, wait, know, I, let's I, back up a little bit. Yeah. The token cards for RSA tokens, that's a security measure, correct? That yeah, is a security measure. Okay. Yep. I just want to make sure yeah. so that our <laughs> listeners understand the security measures. Nothing was in the cloud. Correct. Um, but we had yeah. servers, main servers, where all of the private data was being um, saved and collected. And um, so they had to have a special insert into their computer to be able to access those files on the servers. That That's correct. Yes. Thank you okay. for that. And uh, actually, we used to plug our phone lines in and dial up via modem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember those and the funny noises they made. Yes. <laughs> All uh, right. So I was offered that opportunity at the thing that was I would have to travel. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd never even flown in an airplane and I was in my 20s. So it was something very different. But I knew if I could go out and get this experience, um, that it would it would be meaningful. You know, there was a lot of exposure and a lot of opportunity that if you if you did one project well, then the next would just keep coming. And so I yeah. I took it. I took a leap of faith. It was the first time I left uh, my husband and my son on on their own for periods of time. Um, but I I took my first flight, and that boy. That journey, and I remember the person who uh, was over that project. Um, she walked into the room to that we were all sitting in, and she started to speak. And I said, "Whoa, that's what I want to be when I grow up." <laughs> mm. Just the way that she carried herself, her presence, her self—you know, she just she she the self assurance. Some, yeah, she Which was is in your talents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody to look up to, and that that for me was a moment where I one had my first opportunity to travel, um, where I got to be outside of a comfort zone. I had to stand in front of a group of people. I was voted quietest in my high school graduating class, uh, so it took me outside of all of that and put me in front of a classroom. And if I hadn't done that, I would be in a much different spot today. I just got chills up my spine hearing that, that you were voted most quiet in your high school yep. class. And here you are running your business, hiring people, standing in front of people consistently and with a podcast, <laughs> a successful <laughs> long-term <laughs> podcast. So um, listeners, a little bit of background, Emily and I, during our um, recording for her podcast episode, and we will have links to this later on. Um, we went through her Strengths Finder results. And now that I'm hearing these stories, it's making it even more interesting to me and um, enlightening. We talked about the fact that she has this achiever and developer in her top talents. And that means that she sets goals. She's very goal-oriented. The difference being that her goals are almost exclusively tied to people, where generally, if you have achiever in your top talents, you find that it's surrounded by more task-oriented talents. And here you were showing up to train people, to become a trainer. And that was the thing that lit you up when you were working for um, the, that first with the Xerox company, yep. right? Yep. You were training people and loved it. You were so good at it. And that is such a great demonstration of how your developer and achiever show up together. And then when you described this woman that you so admired, the moment you saw her, one of the, one of the first 
descriptive words you used was self-assured or confident. And you have modeled your own approach to things based on that. And self-assurance is your number five talent. So I'm just over here feeling really good about where where you went in terms of feeding those talents and how you'll continue to make huge impacts in in the work that you do. So, wow. Yeah, and every single one of those is scary, right? So every time you have... (laughs) And and my husband's still nervous to this day. He's like, what do you mean you're starting your own business? What do you mean you're starting a podcast? What do you mean you're going to start keynotes? (laughs) <laughs> and uh yeah he's still along for the ride um and it's just it's it, it, it because you, it, once you step outside of that comfort zone like i i had a cocoon right i had a cocoon right. in my family in my small community i kind of just kept going um but i knew there was a little bit something more <laughs> something different for sure yeah yeah uh i love that <laughs> so um you you moved into this role and what i'd like to get to at this point is what i would love for our listeners to know what you do now because now we have the background we understand how you got to where you are but instead of just saying i teach these people or i do this or i coach that i'd love to hear a specific story of a, a work related either project or client that was recently one that you thought, oh, this is why I'm doing what I do. This is, this is so satisfying. You and I talked a little bit about that during our recording. What, what is a recent moment in your, in your work life, in your income producing activity Mm -hmm. that you realized, ah, this is so good. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I, and it, it just happened. There's so many wonderful moments, but I'm going to share something that happened two weeks ago. Great. So about two, I've been doing work for a client, um, many different aspects. I've got the IT portion that I'm helping them with strategy and things like that. But I also have uh, a client that is very old school um, in their ways of thinking. As a matter of fact, out of a group of probably about 60 or so IT folks, there are three females um, and only two would be considered leadership. So there are things that happen that are obviously just not comfortable and need to be brought up. So one of the things I've been doing is working with their senior leadership on coaching of how to work with women in IT. And I know that may sound silly, but there are still organizations that struggle with that. Uh, Mm -hmm. They struggle with what's you know what is not appropriate behavior or what's not appropriate words or what are situations that you know you just shouldn't put people in um, it's like bringing a woman into an nfl locker room a hundred percent and i'm not exaggerating either no no it's 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 really tough um you know some scenarios of what i was experiencing there are uh, I was invited to a meeting as a subject matter expert, as a C-level individual to provide my perspective. And I was the only female. And when I joined the call, they said, you're taking notes, right? I said, no, it's not my meeting. I'm here as part of uh, the the leadership team. I'm here to provide you with my expertise. This is not my meeting. I will not be taking notes. But for them, because I was only the only female, uh, they just inherently thought that that would be my role. Right. And so had to level set that that's not. So I've been working with their their leadership. And so one individual is just, I I don't, the, the feeling was that he almost didn't realize the times in which he he was doing things that were really undermining the, the females on the team. So I set up a meeting and I had a, a coaching discussion with him but not as his coach. <laughs> it was, I really need you to understand these are the scenarios recently that have ed- that have occurred. 
uh, you know, these are the things that have happened and outlined sheer examples. And the look on his face, you you knew that you, somebody needed to tell him. Like it, it was it was that moment where I, I thought to myself, ev- the other females have been experiencing the same thing. Nobody will use their voice. Nobody will speak up. I'm meant to be in this situation to not only help the women, but also to help this person who is a very good person, very nice, very sweet family man, but didn't realize that actions and how that resonated over to another uh, to another demographic. So I feel fortunate that I was able to do that. I feel like I was meant to be there to help him. Uh, we've since had subsequent conversations. It since has resonated to uh, things changing in the way that meetings are are organized and the way that people are are bringing themselves forward, the way that they're carried. It was impactful. Again, I wasn't necessarily there in the moment to coach, but I had the opportunity to be able to have a very forward conversation with somebody and have it truly make a difference to a lot of people's lives. And that's what I want to do. You know, that's that's every day when I get up, I just want somebody or someone to say, why? That felt great today. I'm, I'm glad that Emily was there to, to support me. I'm glad that I I had her there for help. And you know, I often, I often say my job is to, to help. I start my conversations now with how can I help, not what do you need, but how can I help. And in that case, I felt like I truly helped a, a few different people from a few different perspectives. Oh, that's such a great story, and it definitely demonstrates everything of uh, in in your why the the reason that you do what you do which is all about developing people about um taking somebody that might be underperforming and to guide them to a full access of their capabilities and character and what i heard in that story was partly that man trusted you. You had to build a strong enough relationship that when you pointed out very clearly the specific incidents that were uh, detrimental to him and to his team and to the team overall, he had to he had to trust you for that to be effective in any way and for him to not immediately dig in his heels and get defensive. So that that's the first thing I heard was trust. And the second thing I heard was you said that it wasn't necessarily a coaching appointment, but that's exactly what the best coaches do is they use the language that the person needs to hear to understand. And many times that's asking questions, but there are definitely times where it is laying it out, holding up a mirror and saying, this is what we are seeing. Is that really how you want to be perceived? Yep. And so many times it just takes a moment to hear that. And then you realize, you're right. I do do that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I just had that happen this morning. I had a meeting with one of the people that's going to be facilitating a session at the No Longer Virtual Summit coming up in Austin, Texas on February 10th and 11th. And we were talking about um, the Working Genius Assessment. And one of the aspects of it is, of course, just like any other assessment, is active listening to find out um, how you can help before you start jumping in to solve a problem. And I said, sometimes I'm so bad at that. When somebody says they're in pain, what's the first thing we do? Well, did you take some Advil? Um, Did you do some stretching? Have you seen the doctor? Like... And he said this structure, this um, framework that he uses using this working genius assessment begins with, what have you tried? Yeah. (laughs) Not have you tried, but what have you tried? Uh, Where is the pain? What can we do to support you in exploring, you know, solutions to this? Um, And acknowledging that that is something that 
I struggle with sometimes was painful and so important. Yeah. And I, I think that's what you are doing for these people because you see their potential. You see the the possibility, you see their their humanity behind the the behavior that is wreaking havoc. And I, I think that's a, a critical factor right there is that your goal is to help them get to their goal. It, it has nothing to do with you. And that that's pretty awesome. Yeah. I am here to it truly um being able to to work with people, being able to help, being able to support is uh boy, that brings me great joy. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear that in your voice. So as we as we wrap this up and come full circle, when you think about another pivotal time, obviously having that conversation with him and seeing the the results, because you have that futuristic in your talents, which means you had a future vision in your head as you set the goals and then developed this person to um, a, a better place for, for his career and for the entire organization. That was a beautiful moment of satisfaction. When you think about a future moment of satisfaction, when you walk away from something new, because I know you're, you're taking on new things all the time. You're constantly looking for transition and transformation. Tell me what that future vision is. You know, it's funny. At this point, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, I actually took myself on my very first ever, I called it strategic planning, but it was really a, a weekend by myself at my most favorite place on this planet thinking about what that future moment looks like, um, trying to figure out what are the the, the next, those bite-sized goals that I always like to talk about. And, um, you know, for me, it's going to be being able to walk away from the IT work that I do. Um, probably not all of, all of it. There's still, I think, a part of me, that's just who I am. So I think there'll still be pieces there. But, um, I, I just want to go talk to people full time. And I think for me, that future looks like being able to go speak and share and empower others to use their voice. Uh, like I learned to uh, probably much later in life than I should have, but I have it now. Um, <laughs> that future state looks like sharing my story and being part of the, the, you know, the group of individuals who are you know, selected and, and chosen for events to be able to help others understand that when things happen, you're you're not by yourself and just really help them and really try to change the world um, <laughs> through sharing my stories. Um, and that that's my future state. And so now it's really, like I said, figuring out what that pivotal moment's going to be to be able to um, move that a little bit faster. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, I hear that. We're always a yeah. little impatient. Once we have that idea in our heads, this is what I want. It's it's hard to be patient. So yeah, I love that. I love that. <laughs> Emily, this has been such a pleasure. You said twice now, um, you, you talked about community twice in really important and distinct ways. And the first was, that when we talked about um, family and having that support network, my first thought was it doesn't have to be family. You don't have to have a kid or a spouse to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, but your comment was you need people supporting you along the way. And all I can think is make sure that the people that you are spending the most time with are the people that want to see you thrive and succeed and and be in the the life that you choose for yourself from moment to moment because that changes over time. You, we uh, yeah. hopefully consider what we want every time and not based on one goal from when we were a kid or or twenty years yeah. old. <laughs> and then you mentioned it again at the end of this conversation, being part of a community of people to support other, particularly women in finding their voices and particularly in fields where women aren't as um, 
uh, represented. So that is that I think that message resonates for me. At, it's at a much higher level than anything else. And we've talked about some really important things. So thank you for bringing those up. Yes, thank you. Um, and the, the other thing I would say is that through the course of this year, I have learned more from walking into conversations, 30 minutes, a lot of times, intro with yourself included in this, <laughs> that you know, complete strangers when you begin a call are can be part of your community when you leave and you can learn so much. So I would I also just encourage people to reach out to those who you admire, to those who are doing what you want to do. And you never know who's gonna say yes to a 30 minute conversation and your life can change in that time frame. So uh, that's definitely something I've I've learned this year. Uh probably much more significantly than other years. <laughs> oh, that's so great. And it fits perfectly into this idea of creating the community that you need yeah. to support whatever your goal is that's coming. So, wow. Emily, how can our um, guests, how can our listeners find you and follow you and hire you? And listeners, we will have links to all of this in the show notes at elkinsconsulting.com. Uh, thank you. Yes, I can be found at poweredbyauthenticity.com. Uh, you'll also find the podcast on all major podcast uh, forums. And when you go to the the uh, website, there's direct links there to the podcast, to a personal blog that I have, and there's also a, a contact form. Um, so I'd love to hear from your listeners and have a conversation. And just thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Emily. This was absolutely a pleasure. Listeners, it's your turn. You've heard a lot of inspiring moments in this conversation. What will you take away from it? Maybe you'll reach out to somebody you admire and respect and ask for a 15 or 30 minute conversation just to find out how you can support them and how they can support you. Will you start to build exactly the personal board of directors, the community that you need to take you to wherever you plan to be in the next few years. What will you take from this conversation and what will you do in the next 24 hours to move you in the right direction? I would love to hear from you and I'm sure Emily would as well. Thank you so much for listening. Your stories don't define you, how you tell them will. You must keep on trying Smile, what's the use of crying? You'll find that life is still worthwhile If you just smile